Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime stories like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today, we're going to be talking about Scotty McMillan. Scotty was three years old when his life was tragically taken by his own mother and her mother's boyfriend. Let's talk about Scotty McMillan. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. If you are not familiar with who Scentbird is, they are a perfume subscription. Looking for a gift that keeps giving your round? Give the gift of Scentbird. They have options of three months worth, six months worth, or a full year subscription that can be sent directly to the person you want to send the gift to. What is amazing is you get to pick new fragrances each month from over 600 brands. They also have gift sets that come with fan faves. I've been enjoying Scentbird for a very long time because I truly love their product. Here is what the vial looks like. It is much bigger than your typical sample size and it is perfect to throw into your purse. They say they will last for at least 30 days, but I get way more out of them typically. It, I guess it just depends on how often you use them. Each fragrance each month comes with a card, and the card has all of your notes on it, and it has a picture of the bottle to reference if you ever wanted to go by the full size. I got all new scents this month, and this one is called Fearless by Rachel Zoe, and it has the most delicious coconut smell. It is phenomenal. The spritz is amazing, just the perfect amount. The next one I got is Confessions by a Rebel. The vanilla in this is just yum. It smells so good. And then the last one that I got, Just Bloom by Story Vinzane. I'm probably saying that wrong, of course, but it is another great one. The outer case of these, you can customize the color. If you would like to try Scentbird, I have a code for you guys. Use code KFLOWER to get 55% off and your first month for only $7. Here it is on the screen, as well as I will leave it in the description box. Scentbird just expanded to Canada. Why not? treat yourself too. With Scentbird, you can get a decent amount of high-end fragrances that do not break the bank. And with my code, it is even more affordable. Thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video, and thanks to you guys for listening. Today, I'd like to start with a letter from Scotty's older brother. He was three years older than Scotty. He was six years old when Scotty so life tragically ended. This is the letter he read in court to his mom at her sentencing. Dear Mom, you, Gary, and Amber were trapped in a house of torture. The torture was you guys. The victims were me and Scotty. Scotty got killed. I got beaten. You are the worst mother I've ever known. You just watched us get hurt. I wish you never met Gary. He is really evil. He nearly killed me. You are the reason Scotty got killed. I thought parents were supposed to protect us. Now you are in jail for your time out. Wow. Scott Jacob McMillan was born on January 26, 2011 to his parents, Jillian Tate and Lauren McMillan. And as you have heard, he had a very courageous older brother, Ryan. Scotty's parents, Jillian and Lauren, were in a relationship for a few years, but by the time Scotty was born, Lauren had left Jillian and now his two children, and he moved back to Kansas to live with his mother. Jillian had Scotty alone in the hospital and then went to live with her sister. There are pictures of Jillian during this time that show that she looked really happy. Jillian was described as liking dance parties. That is code for raves. She liked to go to raves. She likes sex and, and just all around have a good time. And I know you're expecting me to say that there was some substances involved, but there is no evidence of her 
having a substance issue or even using substance in general. Even later in life, when decisions were made about her children, still no substances were in the mix. There was chat online that maybe she was addicted to sex and used, and she was very promiscuous. She would say she would enjoy all forms, male or female, as she so chose. That is fine and dandy until her kids stand in the way, but we will get there. So Jillian, 31, was working at Walmart, always Walmart, in Parkstown, PA, and living with her sister. She met Gary Fellenbaum, who was 23, and his wife, Amber, who was 21 because they were co-workers at Walmart. Now, this point is absolutely weird, but to each their own, Jillian became Gary's girlfriend. She had her and her two children move into the mobile home that Gary and his wife Amber lived in, and they also had a 10-month-old little girl that lived in the home as well. One more time, just in case, you know, for the people in the back, Jillian became the girlfriend of married Gary and moved in with him and his wife. In the court filings, it does mention a menage a trois. Just your average happy threesome couple, I guess. Either way, their bedroom lives are not part of this story. Ew, let's not think about that. But their family dynamic is. The three adults and the three children lived in the two-bedroom mobile home at 96 Hope Lane in West Collin Township. According to Jillian's family, she was a good mom to the boys before she met Gary and Amber. Before this, there was no allegations of neglect or no abuse, no contact with child services whatsoever, and apparently none of them had a record of any kind, any police record. I don't know how she was called a good mom and then have the rest of this be her story. But for all we know, before this point, that is what the family members remembers. I am not sure if Gary was ever good because Gary liked to hurt the boys when he felt he was being disrespected. Jillian testified in court that Gary was controlling, only let her sleep one hour a night, and made her run the house on $5 a day. But in the same breath, she admitted to laughing when Gary hung Scotty and Ryan upside down by their feet and punched them in their stomachs. First, why would she find that funny? And second, why did she feel the need to share she thought it was funny, enough to laugh. Gary and Amber verified this in their statements to the police as well. Apparently, it was a good time for Jillian. Ryan, Scotty's older brother, said that he didn't get hurt as bad because he handled the beatings better. He was a little bit older and instinctually understood that taking it was e an easier route. But Scotty was only three years old. He didn't understand that fighting back or trying to get away would just make things worse. When a three-year-old gets hurt and punched in the face by a grown man, he's going to move and avoid the next hit. And of course, he's going to cry hysterically. So Jillian's boyfriend and sister wife, Gary and Amber, found Scotty's resistance just hilarious as well, which only tells me this whole trifecta got off on being cruel when Gary being the ringleader. Three days before Scotty's death, Gary made Scotty cinnamon sugar toast. Delicious. Love that. Scotty couldn't or wouldn't eat it. Gary decided this was Scotty being disrespectful and he will not have any of that. He stuffed the toast in his little mouth trying to force him to eat it and then he started to hit him when three-year-old Scotty spit it out. It just got worse from there and escalated and escalated. Now Gary is punching him in the face and the stomach. When Scotty fell out of the chair, Gary took it as another sign of disrespect. He put Scotty back on the chair and used electrical tape on his legs and arms to hold him there. Beat him with wooden spoons, a frying pan, and a curtain rod. Why were all the extra items needed? Like, I, I, it's just mind-blowing. I have no idea, but I guess once again, 
They just like being cruel. He is a defenseless three-year-old tied to a chair. Make it make sense. I am not sure which one of these degenerates came up with the idea, but they had even made a custom whip for the boys, which was a piece of blue and white braided nylon rope. They wrapped duct tape around the end so it wouldn't hurt Gary's precious hands. He can't get hurt torturing a child. These weapons, curtain rod, frying pan, and wooden spoons were not impromptu weapons. Well, maybe the frying pan, but all the other ones they had been using on the boys already. Mind you, when Scotty died, they had only been living in this mobile home for 23 days. So they started getting creative with the pain early only 23 days in that house. In my opinion, Gary at the very least is a sadist and you will have a hard time convincing me otherwise. Oh, and the sister wife Amber, while she did not join in and hurt the kids, she was there and watched and did nothing. Jillian would say that she's seen scars and bruises on the boys, but she did nothing, and obviously she's seen it. It's a two-bedroom mobile home. It's not a very large home, so maybe she was working. I don't know. So as I mentioned, both Ryan and Scotty were targets. Ryan, Scotty's older brother, was enrolled in kindergarten at Rainbow Elementary, and he had been absent for two weeks. The school tried to contact the family, sent letters, and even made a home visit. The problem is that Jillian never told the school that they moved. So even though the school was trying, they had no way to find Ryan. They had no idea where he was. And Ryan was absent because he was too bruised and beat up. The school would definitely have noticed. You know you are doing something wrong when you have to hide it and keep him out of school. And mind you, they've only been there for 23 days. He's absent for two weeks. This brings us to November 3rd, 2014. Gary and Jillian slam Scotty's head into the wall, denting the drywall. They had done this to Ryan as well. Pictures provided to the public by the DA's office showed several indentations in the wall. They put him under a cold shower to revive him, just to get him back to start it all over again, of course. The next morning, the 4th, Scotty's face was red and swollen from the day before. He was beaten again and still wouldn't eat the toast. I didn't think he could even if he wanted to. So Gary thought he was being disrespectful once again. He punched him so hard that he fell out of his chair. Gary picked him up, put him on the chair, and punched him again. Scotty would try to get away because he was being hit in the face so many times, but Gary would not have it. He taped him to the chair and kept going with Jillian joining in. They used this new bent metal curtain rod, the homemade whip, and even made Ryan, the brother, hit him. But eventually they got bored, wasn't getting the reaction they wanted or the lost interest, I don't know. They freed him from the chair, not to give him a break, no. They hung Scotty upside down with his face over the door and continued to beat him. While he was hanging there crying, his mom reportedly laughed. That is what I was talking about earlier of how she thought it was funny. Scotty by this point is badly injured and started vomiting and then became unresponsive. So they put him in an ice cold bath to wake him as they had done in the past. They've always been able to bring him back. 23 days, you guys. This time he wouldn't wake up. They changed him out of his bloody clothes and put him on a deflated air mattress. And by this time, there was blood coming out of his nose, mouth, and ears. Gary and Jillian left the kids home with Amber while they went car shopping. They came back with dinner. They ate pizza. The three of them had some bedroom fun. Gross. And they decided, mm, let's just take a nap. All this time while Scotty is laying on that deflated air mattress, dying. 
at 7.30 p.m. when Jillian, you know, wakes up from her restful slumber, she finds Scotty not breathing. She screamed for someone to call 911. Amber eventually did at 7.45. The paramedics found Scotty from head to toe with bruises, lacerations, and puncture wounds. He was taken to DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington and pronounced dead on arrival. Not one person that entered the hospital room left without tears, no matter how many children deaths they had seen. When questioned for some reason, all three people told the truth. All of their stories matched Ryan, the six-year-old brother, and him, I do believe. Not all these other evil people, but they all told the truth, which, which is good because it makes the prosecution a lot easier. In Pennsylvania, death that is preceded by torture has a death penalty attached to it automatically. Because of this, all three of them pled guilty. None of them were promised any sentences, just that they would not receive death. And so it was left up to the judge to sentence them. I don't know where you stand on the death penalty, but in some of these cases, I just, just say goodbye to them. Just get them Get them off of Earth. As far as sentencing, we will start with sister wife Amber. She pled guilty to two counts of felony endangering the welfare of a child and two counts of misdemeanor reckless endangerment. She was sentenced to six and a half to 16 years. Gary pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to life without parole. Fingers crossed his days in prison are the opposite of sunshine in rainbows. And mom, Jillian Tate, pled guilty to third-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in the death of Scotty. Also guilty to two counts of child endangerment and conspiracy, simple assault, and the possession of instruments for this crime, the tools of her torture. Superior Court Judge William Platt's statement at Jillian's sentencing, quote, so the record is clear, I've gone outside the guidelines on some of these sentences. I've done so because I can't imagine a factual scenario more horrific than this. I can't imagine an abdication of parental responsibility and conspiracy with another human being to do this to your children. It tugged at the fabric of our entire society. Unquote. She was sentenced to 42 to 94 years. She actually appealed the length of her sentence. She originally was looking at 64 to 128 years, but even the lighter sentence that she was given, she thought she should get less time because she showed remorse. The court didn't see this remorse that she's talking about, and the appellate court upheld her sentence. In what world does Jillian live in that she thinks she deserves a lighter sentence? Her life choices landed her exactly where she was. She deserves to live out her days thinking about what she has done to Scotty until she takes her last breath. But that is just my opinion. The DA, Tom Hogan, said he let Gary take a plea deal because he didn't want to put Ryan, the older brother, through a trial. The great irony of this plea is that Gary Lee Fellenbaum's life was spared because of a child. Because the people up here did not want to hurt Ryan. Gary Lee Fellenbaum's life was saved by one of the child that he beat. This DA was kind of interesting, but he referenced Dante's Inferno and referred to the circles of hell. He said that the seventh circle is the murderers, the ninth circle is for the traitors, and the people of Chester County want there to be a tenth circle reserved for anyone who beats, torture, and kill any innocent child. Fellenbaum should be sentenced to the tenth circle. I agree with Tom Hogan, and I kind of want to watch the movie again. Ryan is living with his aunt. She has adopted him and is raising him as her own son, and they have stated they are keeping the memory of Scotty alive with his brother, Ryan. 
This story was so shocking because Jillian moved herself and her boys into such an unsafe life and stood by and did nothing. Well, I guess she did admit to laughing, so I guess she did do something. But anyways, zero to a hundred in 23 days. It's just heartbreaking. But speaking of 0 to 100, these three didn't have a criminal record whatsoever. Clean, as far as I could find. Maybe they have a juvenile record, but just wild. I was going to say let's leave a blue heart for Scotty, but because of that whip, we are going to leave a yellow heart. Let's leave a yellow heart in the comments for Scotty and his surviving brother, Ryan. I can only hope that Ryan is safe and happy now. Thanks to Scentbird. Check them out. The link is in the description. And thanks to all my channel members and Patreons who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide on the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist if you'd like to check them out. Stay safe, my loves, and as always, remember, if you see something, say something, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Bye.